welcome to part two of our journey through states of consciousness. We're going to look at dreams and sleep disorders. So here we go with some major sleep disorders. Uh, in psychology, we need to know about basically four sleep disorders. You've probably heard of insomnia. That's uh, trouble falling asleep. It's not just trouble falling asleep. It's also trouble staying asleep. Um, but just not being able to stay asleep is not a huge deal. Once you reach middle age anyways, you're probably not going to sleep through the night. It's just not going to happen. Not that big of a deal. You're going to have uh, plenty of good sleep, but insomnia is an extended, prolonged, intense not being able to, to sleep, right? You may have experienced like little episodes of insomnia before um, where, you know, you're really stressed out or you have a lot on your mind, and so you're unable to sleep. And so that would be, but when it continues to happen, that's when it reaches this point of disorder. Um, narcolepsy is where you fall asleep uncontrollably. Um, and that's, I don't know if I spelled that right. There might not be two L's there. Um, that's, you know, again, narcolepsy, whenever we talk about disorders, remember, it's got to occur as a number of things that have to happen. If it just happens once, it doesn't mean you have a sleep disorder. If you fall asleep when you're trying to watch a movie with your, uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, that doesn't mean you have narcolepsy. But if it happens uncontrollably over and over and over again, then there might be something there. So the key here is uncontrollably. Um, and yeah, the next is sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is where you stop breathing for a short period of time while you're sleeping. So you stop breathing. Uh, so um, today, you, like, there's sleep apnea machines. You have to wear this thing over your face while you're sleeping to kind of keep that oxygen flowing. Um, there's surgeries that you could have for sleep apnea, but it's, again, it's a sleeping disorder. And then finally, uh, kind of a, a different one is an, it's called night terrors. Night terrors aren't nightmares. Nightmares occur, nightmares occur during REM sleep. Okay, so the night terrors don't occur during REM sleep. Remember rap, rapid eye movement, that's where you have most of your dreams. Night terrors actually occur during uh, stage four. They actually occur during stage four. One second. So back to night terrors. Night terrors, um, right, don't occur during REM sleep. They usually occur during stage four, which is weird, right? Because if you remember from the last part, stage four only um, occurs uh, towards the beginning of your sleep. So night terrors usually occur within its first two to three hours of sleep. They're usually highly emotional, really kind of terrifying, and they usually don't remember them. So it's a, a, kind of a weird thing. Um, you usually remember your REM nightmares because remember when you're in REM, you remember if this is consciousness up here, right? REM is right below that. So, you know, REM is right up here. And so you can remember this stuff because you're close to consciousness. Um, whereas night terrors, they occur way, 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 way down here, right? This is where night terrors occur in stage four, okay? Um, just some practical advice for if, you, if you're experiencing some sort of insomnia, not any clinically diagnosed insomnia, but experiencing some things, ways to fall asleep is exercise, right? Exercise is not too close to bed because you'll be all psyched up, but just exercising and tiring your body out will help you sleep really well. Avoiding caffeine, especially in the second part of the day. Um, relaxing with dimmer lights. Remember that light triggers your suprachiasmatic nucleus to stop releasing uh, melatonin so you won't fall asleep. But if the lights are dim or there's no lights, you'll fall asleep faster. Sleeping on a regular schedule. Um, and so those are types of ways to fall asleep. Um, also, like you can use some sorts of operant conditioning and only use your bed to associate your bed with sleeping. Don't watch TV in your bed. Don't do homework in your bed. Don't do anything in your bed but sleep in your bed. And that could also help lead to, you know, better sleep. Now, why do we dream? Uh, a couple or a few different theories. Freud has got the, uh, the first. He, you know, Freud says we basically have uh, this manifest or um, yeah, manifest content of our memories, and that's the stuff that we can remember. That's the stuff that we can talk about. That's kind of kosher to talk about. And then we have this stuff called latent content, and that's the stuff that's not really socially acceptable to think about or talk about. And that's what we dream about, right? And so it says some deeper 
level. Um, problems with this is it's not going to be scientific support, which is what the problem is with all of Freud's stuff. There's no scientific support, and you can basically say anything, and you can't prove yourself wrong with anything Freud says. So that's kind of the problem here. Um, the information processing model um, is that dreams help us sort out the day's events. They help us consolidate information. Um, but the problem with that is, you know, that makes sense, but the problem is that why do we have meaningful dreams then? If it's just sorting out the day's events, why do we have meaningful dreams about stuff that we have never experienced before? So that's a question. Um, a physiological function, you know, your brain goes and has REM sleep because it helps preserve and develop these neural pathways that we talked about in biopsych. And while this may be true, it still doesn't explain why we have these meaningful dreams, right? Why does, why does this stuff mean something? If we're just doing it to, for maintaining purposes, why do we have meaningful dreams that we know uh, mean something? Uh, there's another theory, activation synthesis in that um, your REM evokes random visual signals and your brain just weaves those things together into a story. Um, problem with this is that you got the story, but the story still tells you something about the individual. So your dreams do mean something to you. And finally, the last is cognitive development, and that dreams reflect the dreamer's cognitive developments, their understanding. Again, but this doesn't address the neuroscience of the dreams, like the pathways and whatnot. And that's about it. Eli's crying, so I'm going to go. Thanks. Bye.